Uh, good morning. As uh, Professor Farhani said, I'm Professor Pons, Victor Pons. And um, I just retired from San Diego State, 43 years of teaching. Can you believe that? And uh, so now I am, uh, I hold the title of Emeritus. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Southern Sea. Now, I know all of you guys have heard about the Southern Sea. They live in California. Southern Sea is in California. But where is it? Is it right along the border with uh, Nevada? Like it's more out there to the east, right? Nevada. It's out there somewhere, right? How long has it been there? Well, I don't know. It's been there since uh, 100, 100 years. So today I'm going to, I've been doing work on the Southern Sea since 1997. Off and on. So that's what, 26 years. And uh, I produced two, several others, but two other major uh, pieces of literature, online literature that I have produced on the Southern Sea. This is my site, my website. I'm going to go to this site and look for the two references that I'm going to be um, talking about today. And I'm not sure how serious about uh, you are about the Southern Sea, but if you wanted to go back and review what I have said, you can review just about everything that I'm going to say because I'm going to basically read the, the stuff out right here. And you can read it on later or reread it. Okay, so what I do in here is I go to learning over here, learning, and I get to learning, right? And then I get to hydraulics because I have several other areas. And I'm going to go to a certain link over here, which is at the end. The Southern Sea Invited Lecture, November 29. There it is. So I'm going to be referring to two articles that are online, as you can see. And they've been online for a long time. I just, over the last week, I, I put this, this page together to focus on the two papers that I'm going to be presenting to you today. The first one's called Time Engineering, the Singular Case of the Southern Basin. Time Engineering? What is that? I mean, you heard of engineering, you heard about time, but time engineering? Well, this is a concept that yours truly developed maybe 10 years ago. So it's a, it's a kind of a brand new concept or a relatively new concept, and we're going to get in there. But time engineering, the singular, the singular case of the Southern Basin. And I'm, I'm going to be spending about 30 minutes, I've got about 50 minutes here on this time engineering, it plus and minus, you know, 25, 30 minutes. Then I move on to an assessment of what the Southern Sea is. I wrote this assessment maybe 20, 25 years ago, and the time engineering is relatively new, it's only 10 years. So let's uh, jump into this, time engineering, the singular case of the Southern Basin. Over here, I am going to see if the thing works. No, it doesn't work. Oh, there it is, it, it took a while. Okay, so time engineering. This is the Southern Sea. Is it a natural or artificial sea? The answer is it's artificial. On its own, it wouldn't exist. So let's see why I, I was saying this. So here's the Southern Sea flanked by the Imperial Valley. You guys have heard about the Imperial Valley, right over here. It's the Imperial Valley, and on the other side, the Coachella Valley, uh, much smaller. The Imperial Valley claims to be the best irrigation project in the United States and perhaps through the world, by the way. It's not officially confirmed that that is the case, but that is the Imperial Valley. It's a large valley, about 200,000 acres, I believe, which has been functioning since the year 1900. I believe it started operating little by little in 1901. So it's been operating for 122 years, the Imperial Valley. What does it do? But it actually, it's an irrigation project on this land that used to be called the Colorado Desert. Because prior to the development of this project, the color of this was like this. And, and this was not black. It was not there. The color of this was like that, too. Only that this is a depression. Uh, greatest depth is about minus 200 feet. 200, 250 feet. So this is a hole already. Interestingly, this whole area over here is at about sea level. So over here, minus, it's minus 200 feet below sea level. So it's a depression. How was it formed? Well, depressions all over the world, but how was this formed? This was formed by tectonism, moving on the geologic plates. So that's the story. So what, what we say at the beginning here is the lake, is really, it's really a lake, but it's called a sea for some reason, because it's large. 
As a matter of fact, right now, it is the largest lake in California. What kind of water does it have? Well, actually, it does have dirty water. It's irrigation return flow. And irrigation return flow is, is contaminated with salts, all kinds of salts and all kinds of stuff out there. But it's supposed to be a dump. So it is a good dump. It holds all, everything that we don't want. Why there? Why don't we move it somewhere else? Why would be very expensive? This is a hole. It's nice to throw your stuff that you don't like in the hole, right? So that's what we have done for 120 years. California, the U.S. Why are we doing this? Because we want to profit correctly, and we should, from the products of this area. There are a lot of products. Plus, the soil is very good because this soil over here, all it needs is water. So the soil is very good. So at the time when people did this uh, 123 years ago, they saw the good, but they didn't quite see the bad. And if they saw it, they said they, they chose not to look at it too much because we were going to do something good. Basically, that, that, that's the origin of the Southern Sea. Now, it is for the last 50, 60 years, it has become a headache because it's unsightly. It may smell a little bit and so on and so forth. Um, but we as a society, particularly the state of California, we don't know what to do yet with it. And my position or my vision is that it cannot be solved. It's a problem that's been going on for too long, five generations. And five generations, depending on who you're talking to, it may be too long or too short. But in my book, it is long because we have profited with five generations. Five generations of people have profited off this very big enterprise of irrigation, which is fine. Some people have gotten rich, but it has been at the expense of the, of the creation of the sea which is a dump in a dump. You guys know a dump, nobody wants to look. So that's the reason why I think I'm gonna have a raise, uh, raising of the hands here. How many of you have actually been out there on the shores of the sea? One person, yeah, and you're from Italy. She's from Italy. Are you curious to go out there? Maybe you should get your car out there this weekend or the following weekend and head out there. Where, well, how would you go there? Well, do you have to go east on I-10? Uh, I, I was gonna say I-8, but no, it's I-10. We gotta go east for about two hours. And then once you get to El Centro, then you, you turn left and go about 30 minutes or 40 minutes, and you hit the sea, right? You get over here, you're coming over here, and then moving over here like this, and then you hit the sea. Then you'll see the largest human-made lake in California. Technically, officially, is the repository of agricultural wastewaters. Probably the largest repository of irrigation wastewaters in the world. So in California, in the U.S., and the world. Okay, so that's the Southern Sea. And here comes Professor Bonds to develop, develop the concept of time engineering. Like I said, you've heard of time and you've heard of engineering. I'm going to slow here. I'm going to speed up. Time engineering is the engineering that is carried out for the specific purpose of buying or obtaining an indefinite time from nature. That's exactly what society did here. When I say society, I mean California society. Although we were aided by the federal government eventually for various reasons, uh, because obviously we're part of the United States. But this is basically what the people in California back in the turn of the last century, 123 years ago, decided to do as a project. I should tell you at this point, that some people were negative about developing the sea at the time because they said this and that and what and so forth. Okay, but the government decided, the government, at the time, the US government decided to support this activity because they wanted people to move west. They wanted to develop the west. Don't forget, I'm talking about 900, uh, 1923 years ago. They wanted to develop the west. It is no uh, surprise that the federal government created the Bureau of Reclamation, the Bureau of Reclamation of Lands in the Western United States. And that was done by Teddy Roosevelt in 1903. So you see the dates match, 1903, 1900, 1901, and so forth. So it was at the time. So basically the government supported this effort because it was a matter of showing that people could move to California and make a living of California because the, the, um, the idea at the time from people that were like, he used to live in Illinois, they would say to themselves, why would I want to go to California? Because it doesn't rain there. A couple of years, it won't rain. There's be a drought and I'll, I won't survive. But then the government came in and said, no, you, we're going to support you. We're going to make sure that we got the engineers, the irrigation engineers that will move the water from here to there, which is exactly what they have done uh, with hydraulics, my profession, and proceed to develop the sea. So time engineering, I developed this concept because before time engineering, you would design a project 
on a frequency basis. You would say, I want this building to last 100 years. So that's what we did. Or this dam should last 500 years, or this bridge should last 1,000 years, or whatever. So we put a time frame into the situation. But it's usually like 100 or 50 or 1,000. But this project is more like in the millions, in the millions of years. So this is something outside of the frame of frequency base. So we had to come up with some different idea. And that's exactly what I'm going to be saying in here. So let's look at first time engineering. Time engineering defined as the engineering which has the specific purpose of buying time from nature. And we compare our own time, 25 years, 50 years, two generations, with the time of uh, the United States, 200 years, or the time of uh, AD, you know, after Christ, 2000 years, right? Or civilization, when civilization started, which is purported, it was started in China about 12,000 years ago when they domesticated rice 12,000 years ago. After China came Egypt and all the other civilizations, ancient civilizations that we that you have learned about in, in our, your, your studies of history. So time is a long time. Uh, civilization, human civilization, about 10,000 years, which amounts to 0.0002% of the so-called geologic time, which is purported to be 4.6 billion years. And that, even that is argued in the literature. So time is infinite in this sense. And our time is very small compared to that. We, have to, we need to keep that in mind. Nevertheless, we come up with practical solutions to solve that problem of time. And we do things because we have to do things. We got the, we're here, we got to sustain and feed ourselves, right? So we're going to come up with the projects to do this. And this Imperial Valley is one of those projects. I compare in here uh, time engineering, the concept of time engineering with frequency-based design. For instance, I have been involved in a few, I would say three or four, dam designs through my career. And we have had to determine what was, what was going to be the frequency of design. The last one we did, we did for 10,000 years because it was done in South America and they didn't have what in the U.S. we call the problem maximum flood, which is a flood that does not have any reference to time. So we chose the 10,000 years because that what, that's, what, that's the amount of years that people use in lieu of the problem maximum flood. 10,000 years is 400 generations, and that's supposed to be fine. So dams that we design could fail, certainly, as long as if you have a flood that exceeds the frequency of 10,000 years, the dam's supposed to fail. If it doesn't fail, then we're lucky, but it's supposed to fail. The question is, those 10,000-year those floods don't come very often. Let's look, move at the case of the Southern Basin. I say a significant case of time engineering is that of the Southern Basin, geologic depression between two parallel faults, that's called a graben. I believe that word originates in Germany or German, located in southeastern California. So now let's take a look at the geomorphology. I consider the sciences of geology and geomorphology underpinning the un understanding of the entire field of civil engineering, excluding perhaps Professor Dao, who is our guest visitor today. Professor Dao. I call him a guest visitor because in 1987 he was he was my student. It was like 40 years ago, right? A little more. He was he was sitting right there where you are right now, but that was more than 40 years ago. But at any rate, the geology and geomorphology are extremely important. If we don't teach you that, if you work in hydraulics, you're gonna have to learn it. And if you don't learn it, you're not gonna do well. As, as a matter of fact, I would say you're gonna do bad if you don't know your geology and geomorphology. Over here, what's Perhaps you heard about geology, but perhaps you don't quite grasp the concept of geomorphology. What is geomorphology? This is geomorphology. What are we talking about here? Well, this over here is the Gulf of California, the, the northern part of the Gulf of California. This part is Mexico, because this is the United States over here, the yellow line, the United States, top, and this part of here is Mexico. So, and what's this? This is the Colorado River, second or third largest river in the United States. I think it's third. I think it's... Mississippi, Columbia, and Colorado. And this is the Colorado River coming over here, okay? And the Colorado River came, comes from the Colorado Canyon, Canyon of the Colorado River, right? And you guys know, have you been, how many of you have been to Colorado Canyon? If you go out there, look at the feet in the field. But the point is that out there for about a million years, this channel has been developing and removing that silt and sand and rocks and stuff out there up from the canyon, and where do you think it went? It went to the mouth, to the end, the part where the river reaches the ocean. So this is the ocean here, so this is very low. This is at zero level, 
And here's the Colorado River coming from Utah, originates in Utah somewhere, it goes through Arizona, eventually gets over here to its mouth. And what does it do? It dumps all the solids. Why? Because it gets down to a point where it goes, it's coming like this, and then it goes to this way. So it dumps the solids. So everything, everything you see in here is called a delta. Very clearly, clearly a delta, right? So this is a delta of the Colorado. Where is it located? In Mexico. But part of it is in Yuma, is in the delta of the Colorado. In Yuma, is in the United States. Yuma, Arizona. What in comes the border here, and this is the city of Mexicali. And what do we have over here? We have the United States. Here is El Centro, Raleigh, and all three or four other small towns out there in the Imperial Valley. Okay, so this is geomorphology. Why do I think this is geomorphology? Because let's go back. Let's imagine what would be the case more than four million years ago when the Colorado River had not cut its gorge through Arizona and Utah. And when it was flat, maybe a long time ago, maybe four million years ago, the ocean was free to move inland. And in fact, it did. And it reached all the way to the city of Indio. How many of you guys been to Indio? Not too many. But the city of Indio is south of Palm Springs, I believe. Okay, Palm Springs, Indio, and then El Centro. So this used to be part of the ocean, part of the Baja Gulf of California. And it moved over there. That was four million years ago. Fast forward for a million years, all of a sudden there's a barrier over here. So the question that I would ask at the beginning is, barrier? It doesn't look like a barrier. It is actually a barrier. It's a mound. So the question that geomorphologists need to answer is, how deep is that mound? Because if it were not deep at all, this water would continue to move. But no, the water now is going in here. It's stopped in there. This mound is about 13 meters, about 40 feet. So by now you may say, hey, I've been over there, Professor Pons, but there's no mound out there. I don't see any mound. Because this mound is very, very uh, smooth. You're sitting, sitting here, and all you see is flat terrain everywhere, left, right. So in, in, if you had an instrument, you could determine that, in fact, it's not flat. The water falls over here, moves to the right, and it falls over here, moves to the left, right next to the river, right? So now, now we get into our field, sedimentation engineering. It's part of hydraulics, okay? How do we study this? And the answer is, well, we can look at the, trans the transport of sediment and, and figure out many things out there. But the point that I want to make in here is that over the years, prior to the development of the Imperial Valley or this delta, with the vagaries of the flow, it moved left or right. Sometimes it would move right and sometimes it would move left. When it moved left, it went to the ocean. Fine. Nobody bothers. When it moved right, it went to the to the southern sea, to the depression, it eventually moved into the depression, right? So every 500 years or so, the sea will fill up and it will take maybe 10, 15 years to dry out because there's a lot more evaporation than precipitation. <laughs> every 500 years, roughly. That's what people, that's what people that have studied this thing uh, say. So that used to be called Lake Coahuila. But then what happened was in the last couple of hundred years, we went in there. Actually, it was the year 1900. Like I told you, it was almost a couple, three years before the, they created the Bureau of Reclamation. We went in there. Engineers went in there. Civil engineers went in there. And they figured out our kinds, our profession went in there and you figured out that only we could bring water over here, that we would create a tremendous amount of profit by, by virtue of irrigation. So they decided to bring the water from the Colorado, the Colorado River. The Colorado River has water? Yes, of course. It could have a lot of water. It's the third largest river in the, in the United States. So they basically made sure that the water was, was brought over here, and then they could develop the over here. I'm sorry. The water was over here, and then they pumped it. They put it in the channels, and they developed they delivered the water into the United States in order to create the Imperial Valley. This is an old, I call it uh, legacy, a legacy relief map of the Colorado, which I was able to pull out from reports, old reports of the Bureau of Reclamation. I'm going to show you what we've been talking about here. Here is the Colorado River. Gets over here, that's the, its mouth. And then it spreads the sediment. Okay, it can move right or left because this is a, this is a, um, an area which at around this point, the highest elevation is about, like I said, 13 meters. So it goes below. When it goes into the United States, it's already at zero. And over here, it's minus 200 feet. And if it moves to the right, it's 13. I'm sorry, I'm changing the feet. 13 meters, and then it's zero meters over here, the sea, right? So as you, you can imagine the mound, the mound. So it goes over here. That's the river. That's the river. There's an area over here, I believe it's called Hardy something, Hardy River, New Mexico, but with an English name. 
which 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 ha has the highest elevation of the mound. Where did this all all this sediment come from? Where did it all come from? Well, it came from situation like this. This is the Colorado River at Horseshoe Bend, Arizona. I don't know if you guys been out there. How many of you guys visited out there? You should go out there. It's nice. It's it's a, it's for, it makes for good picture taking. I actually took this picture. No, I take that back. I took a picture. It didn't come out too well, so I went to the boat and pulled and, and pulled out the the best Horseshoe Bend. Uh, uh, this is a very good picture. All this all this stuff in here is sitting in that mound that I was talking to you about at the mouth. So as you can see. 100, fast forward 120 years, and we have the largest irrigation project in the world. The largest, and I should say, best managed. It's a tremendous effort that engineers, U.S. engineers, have put in there for the last 120 years. I would definitely call it the best irrigation system from a technical standpoint. But there's one thing that people at the time did not know, and I should say that clearly. The newest the soils, the more trash it generates. How is that? That would take me 20 minutes to explain. But let me just say that the old soils, like in the Amazon, those are old soils. There's no salt left in the Amazon because all the salt washed out for millions of years. But over here in the Colorado desert, the soils were brand new, geologically brand new. And it's like in a package of chocolate, a piece of chocolate. You eat the chocolate, right? But you have the irrigation projects use of the major salts. They use potassium and magnesium. Most of it, 80, 90% of the potassium and magnesium are used. But the other two, which are sodium and calcium, those are the salts, the uh, salt cations. They're not used, so they're, they're trashed, thrown away. So therefore, there's a lot of sodium and calcium in the Southern Sea that came out from the irrigation. We use the potassium and magnesium and we throw away the sodium and calcium. You could say at this point, if you don't know, say, well, why don't we use the sodium and calcium? There's too much of it, mountains of it, too much. Impossible to use all of it. We don't have any means for doing that. So we basically created the Southern Sea, as I said, as a dump, or technically as a repository of agricultural wastewaters. So there is our situation over there. Brawley, El Centro, Mexicali, capital of the state of Baja, California. El Centro, Brawley, those are the two major towns. So that's the Southern Sea. Now we know. It, I should spend a couple of minutes saying that in 1905, there was a problem over there. The Colorado came in flood. There was a hydrologic error in there. Now, I should say error. There was a lot of, uh, I mean, there was bad luck. It happens. You know, you guys have had instances of bad luck. There was bad luck. And what happened was the Colorado had a flood stage. And uh, at the time, engineers were trying to get a little bit of the water so that they can pump it or send it back north. But they, since we're talking 1905, you know, there was not a whole lot of technology at that point. What happened was that the Colorado saw the engineering and said, I can run over this. And it just ran and it turned around. It you turn. The Colorado was going this way to the Pacific Ocean, or actually to the Cowboy, saw the structure over there. I can jump over this. It jumped and it turned around and it was back to the United States. It flooded for two years, the Imperial Valley. I don't, some people actually lost a lot. <clears throat> And, and we fought for a couple of years, 1905, 1905 to 1907, to control the rivers. They had to come down a little bit so that we could control it and so forth. It's a large river. It carries a whole lot. And finally, it took us two years with the aid of the federal government, and we did control the Colorado, which, but it turned right and went through the United States. Could that event, bad event, happen again? That's a question that I'm going to answer later on. So I pose a question in here. Will the Colorado River again attempt to flood the Southern Basin. It already did it in 1905 and 1907. And we had to fight, like I said, tremendously. There's a book written on this subject, by the way, that I, uh, if you're interested, the book is there. It, it's a book, it's one of the most fascinating books that I ever read because I'm a hydraulic engineer. And this book is exactly that. It tells every detail of what actually happened in terms of the birth and, and a, a few year, beginning years of the Southern Basin. Will the Colorado River again flood the Southern Basin? The answer to this question is probably. Less certain is the time frame of the probable occurrence. It could be a thousand years or 500 as it has been documented, or perhaps it could be more. Why? More time. Why? Because right now we got two big dams in the interim. In 1940, 19, 1930, and 1940, we built two big dams out there on the Colorado. And those big dams are supposed to hold onto the water so that we can send it somewhere else. Fuel hydraulics, right? But they also hold on to the sediment, of course, and they're filling up. But in the meantime, there's not, they're not full yet, but these uh, dams are controlling the floods. 
And since floods is all about, we're talking about floods here. If we have an uncontrolled flood, it could go anywhere. It could go wherever it wants. But these floods are under control at this point. So we say that it is not likely that an event like 1905 will happen as long as these two dams are operating. But maybe in 50 more years, the dams will not operate. We will take them down. They got full of sediment. You know, that's one of the things. So if we either leave them out there and they are not attenuating anything because the dams are full of sediment, right? They're not attenuating the flood anymore. At that point, then we run the risk again, maybe in 50 years that that this flood could happen again because the, the dams are not there to defend us. We could create another dam, but that's a problem. Right now in the United States, it's extremely difficult, almost impossible to build a new dam. That was done 50, 100 years ago, but we needed the water and that was the only thing we saw. But now there's other interests, you know, uh, biology, ecology, and so forth. And it, it has become over the last 50 years, very difficult. So I'm telling you that it may not happen and then it may. We may be faced with the Colorado going uh, a month here and flooding and going back to the returning, making a U-turn, going to the U.S. and at that point, flooding the Imperial Valley, flying, flooding everything out there, probably killing a lot of people if it were to be a surprise. Related question is the following. In view of the inherent hydrological risk, should the southern basin have been developed at all? Some people say, you know what, we should never gotten into the southern sea. Because, okay, you got this irrigation, good. Many people got rich. But you also have the southern sea. And people don't like the southern They don't want to go into the southern sea. None of you have gone out there. It's not something that people go there to visit. Maybe you go there to study, like I've been many times, but not to visit. <clears throat> How many, the ratio between those that like to visit and they just like to study, it's very, very large, okay? So we don't go out there to visit. We used to, though. When the lake had the salinity of the ocean, which is 35,000, it was nice to visit in the 1950s. And there was development out there of Hollywood moving there and so forth for maybe 10, 15 years. But by the time of the 70s, it had already gone about 35,000. It was at 40, 45, and that, that was not very good anymore. There was a lot of money lost over there on the demise of the Southern Sea as a tourist attraction. So that's the story of the Southern Sea. And I finally say here, thus in the realm of time engineering, human-driven economic interests are poised to rule over nature's geomorphological truisms. Is this a truism? Yes, everything I told you is 100% correct. Somehow I don't agree with it. You can argue with me if you want to, but I've studied this for years. And we know our geomorphology. Several years ago, six, seven years ago, I wrote a paper. And I call the paper Eco-Hydroclimatology, the case for geomorphology. Meaning, if you're going to solve a problem in eco-hydroclimatology, go look at geomorphology, otherwise you're going to do anything. It's an 80-page paper, which I have on my site, by the way. So I, those of you that are interested and want to see something interesting, go out there and take a look at this. Now we're going to look at the assessment, and I only have left. I only have left. Uh, I won't be able. I don't have the time to go over all this, all these points. South and Sea is the largest lake in California. Many of the things I'm going to say in here are uh, reiterating what I had already said as a story. Now this is like a bullet point. Strictly speaking, it's not a sea. I don't know why they call it a sea. It should be called South and Lake. But from the beginning, they started calling it a sea, maybe because. In the middle of the desert, it looked like a sea or something like that. But it's, uh, we can't change the name now. It's the Southern Sea. Everybody knows that it's the Southern Sea. It's not a sea, but a geologic depression. It's a depression below sea level. But it was built, uh, it stuck between mountain ranges and the line below sea level. It has been used as a repository of agricultural wastewater. That's known. That's already known. We know that for a fact. The sea is deteriorating for its other uses. Tourism, gone. Fly path. <clears throat> We don't know. It depends. It depends whether the whether the birds are going to be able to read the signs that says contaminated water. You you know that that's not going to happen. But they're not stupid. They're going to figure it out. If they start dying, then they'll go somewhere else. So it has happened, by the way, in California. We have the case of Kester Town, maybe 20 years ago up in Northern California. Should the sea effectively a sink what is waters be left to degrade slowly with time? I have calculated if we, that if we leave it alone in about 120 years, the salinity of the sea would be the same as Salt Lake in Utah. Only the Salt Lake is natural. This one would be entirely artificial because this started at zero and it went to 120,000, which is the salinity of Salt Lake. Salt, Lake's, uh, Salt Lake varies in salinity. It's a large lake. So it would convert itself into another Salt Lake. 
in the next 120 years. What we let, what we let the southern developer deteriorate to that point or advance to that at that stage? And the answer, it depends on the population of California, the cities of California, the governor, the people in charge, the politicians need to decide, decide what to do. They could leave it alone, continue business as usual, try to fix it, repair it. That's extremely expensive in the billions of dollars. It has been talked about, but it's not that people haven't done anything because they haven't figured out where to get the money. 20 years ago, there were people, politicians here were looking in some in, uh, uh, Congress in Washington, D.C., see if they could get some federal government in order to do something about it. And the, the, the representatives that had to give the money, because, you know, every amount of money is allocated by the, by the federal government. They were wondering where the sea is. Show me a picture. I've never been there. I haven't heard of it. And they're not going to vote for something they heard of, right, in, in order to give money to a project that they haven't heard of. At the time, it was unknown. Now, a lot of people have learned a little bit more, but it's still largely unknown outside of California. Even in California, it's unknown. Should we fix it and decrease the salinity somehow? Right now, it's at 60. Should we bring it down to 35, which is where the sea would be? It would really be the sea. Well, you got 25,000 ppm in a large lake. Where are you going to put that salt? The answer would be, well, hang, uh, haul it to the ocean and dump it in the ocean. That's expensive, right? It would take, I think the calculation was 500 tons every day. In other words, 500 tons of salt would move into the lake every day. That can be calculated, by the way. Okay? So you can get all that salt and dump it over to San Pedro. Out there. You guys know where San Pedro is, right? The port of L.A. But no, that's going to be a problem because the people out there are going to protest. They're going to say, you're ruining my ocean. It should be 35. You're putting 45 in there. Yeah, I don't have to have it. We got that nothing in the professor. So people are here nodding. <laughs> salinity of the ocean is something that people shouldn't touch. Because if you touch it, then you ruin the fish. The fish are used to 35. They're not used to 45. You see? So that's the issue here. Origin. The Southern's depression and its status prior to human intervention was closely linked to the prevailing geology and geomorphology. Geology formed the gravin. Geomorphology continued to operate it. History. In 1905, a diversion was engineered in the Colorado River, a few miles south of Yuma, Arizona. Unexpected flood, flood caused the diversion to fail. And I'm a hydrologist, and I'm going to tell you a story on this. Why did it fail? Weren't we out there looking at it so that it wouldn't fail? Weren't there good hydrologic engineers out there figuring out the frequency of the plots and so on and so forth? Well, first of all, we should consider this 1907. 1905, it's, it's at the beginning of engineering here in the United States. Right, but the hydrologists had looked at it, serious hydrologists, and they figured out that the Colorado, if it if it flooded, it'll flood early once or twice, no more floods. So then they decided to build a temporary structure right after the second flood, which they did, and they thought they were safe. Well, you know what happened? God sent a third flood, which was not on the record. They had 27 years of record, and then gamble on 27 years of record that there were going to be at most two floods on the Colorado. First, second came, hey, let's go, let's do it. Then they started and built this temporary kind of chancy structure, which was gonna sustain, was not gonna sustain a big flood. And then the third flood came, erased the structure, and that was two years of fight. We had two years of fight to try to get the Colorado back on its supposed course, the course that we wanted it to take, not the one that nature wanted it to take. And you know, salinity. In 1907, the average salinity was 3,500 parts per million. And they had to do a lot with, uh, the, with the, uh, the salt that had collected at the bottom of the lake. Up to the year 2005, the lake was close to hydrologic equilibrium with inflows closely matching outflows. Why do we have a lot of water? The water is feature. Without the drainage, agricultural drainage, Imperial Valley could not operate. Why? Because the plants take all the water they want by evapotranspiration, but they leave all the salt, the salt behind. They don't take any salt. So the salt accumulates no matter what. The only way to sustain the irrigation project is to drain, to lixiviate, meaning run a lot of water, push the salt down, and then co co locate a drain at the bottom, maybe four feet below. The entire Imperial Valley is constructed over uh, of, on drains. The entire Imperial Valley, this was done four generations ago, because if they didn't do that, they couldn't irrigate. They couldn't produce. They had to leave. And this is something that happens all over the world, by the way. There is an ASCE Agricultural Drainage Manual 
pub published in 1991, which tells exactly how to do this. And this the interesting story about this manual, which is a little side story, which is that that book has 26 chapters. ASCE Manual 75. The first 25 chapters tell you how to do it, how to remove it, the hydraulics, the concentrations, and all the technical stuff. Very elaborate technical, chemical, and biological. The last chapter, written by one Van Schildgard, the title of that chapter is, Should We Be Doing Irrigation at All? When I saw that, I, I, I really grew up. I was old already, but I said, what? What nerve? This guy has the nerve to put at the end of a book whether we should be doing this or not. But Van Schildgard was Van Schildgard. He had worked on irrigation for 50 years. He was retiring. He had learned a lot, good and bad and ugly. And he realized to spill it all, spill all the beans. Guys, should we be doing this? And to this day, we still continue with the question, should we be doing this? And we continue to do irrigation projects around the world. But the idea is that we've got to do them right. But to do an irrigation project right is expensive because you got to handle the salt that should be coming out, put it somewhere. Long story made short, the project in the Southern Sea, uh, uh, Imperial Valley, was not expensive because they didn't have to throw away the trash. <laughs> The trash was piled up in the neighborhood. Had they had had they been obliged to get rid of the salt, whatever that meant at the time, they would not be rich, or else they would have desisted. They would have said, "I'm sorry, I can't do this. It's too expensive." So that's the true story of the Southern Sea on the Southern Basin. Salinity is a problem. Where are the salts? I've got I've got five minutes. Where are these annoying salts? Where are they come from? How come there are so many? Is this a curse of nature? The collection of salt for time geologic is collected now in the ocean. It's 3.5%. So out of 100 pounds, three, three and a half pounds are salt. If you evaporate 100 pounds of water, three and a half, it's a lot of, a lot of salt. It's out there. Uh, we don't know how this whole thing originated. What we know is the source, the source and the origin of the salts. The salts are coming from the rocks. The rocks have purportedly 11% of salt in their matrix. So if you take the whole uh, soil, the salt, the rock first, dissolve it into soil, then take the soil out, what are the percentages of salt? 11%. There's a lot of salt. So we assume, quite, I think quite correctly, that that 11% in the rocks represents now 3%, 3.5% in the ocean. And the ocean is huge, right? So therefore, as you can see, where the salt is. Is it a curse of nature in some sense? I mean, life would be much different if the ocean was not salty. But then the salt was there, and it had to be removed by, by weathering and so forth. So you could say kind of perhaps we, the creator at the beginning, should not have put salt into the rocks. <laughs> but that's, that's wishful thinking. The salt are there, and they will continue to be there. So the salt already present in the salt toolbox, lo local or old geologic salt. In other words, the salt profile has out already. Why is that? Because of the old age. In the Imperial Valley, if you go in, like for instance, if you go to the, to the New River and you look at the profile on the size of the river, you see salt crusts out there that nobody put in there. It, it's there a long time ago, right? So that's the old geologic salt. The second, salt brought within the, with the irrigation water. All the irrigation water brings some salt. So you're adding. You're adding salt by bringing the irrigation water. All water has salt, as a matter of fact. Amounts vary, but all of them have salt. To give you an idea, the cleanest river in California is a, is a river out there in the, in the border of, of Oregon that is 80 ppm. And the dirtiest, well, there's a whole bunch of dirty rivers, but I can give you an example. The Colorado River is about 800 ppm. So we do the Colorado River, which is 800 ppm. In, the, in this river, Anhem River in Northern California, 80 ppm. It's the range, typical range of salinity in the rivers. So the, all rivers have salt. The salt produced by the weathering of the soil minerals as a result of irrigation. This is the salt that was discovered in the manual, which led Van Schilgard to ask himself the question, should we be doing this? We're gonna develop this piece of land. It's, very, it's gonna be very productive because we're gonna be able to extract the magnesium and the potassium that we need, the olive plants need, and it has to be thrown somewhere else. Right? So that is the problem. And finally, the salt leaks from the salt profile because of excessive fertilization. All land is fertilization, but there's a problem. The problem is you don't know when it's going to rain. What if you fertilize because you feel it's needed, and then all of a sudden, once in a year, 
there's something, uh, an event of rain happens, all the fertilizer you put in the ground, half, most of it is going to go into the, uh, into the drainage, right? So you're going to lose it. So you're going to lose it. So that is a problem. Fishing and recreation, we already talked about. Wildlife, yes, there used to be a camping ground out there. I've actually come 25, 30 years ago, camped in the South of the Sea when I was studying it. I figured I should see that. And I'm going to be finished. I'm already exceeded my time. But at any rate, let me just finish by saying the status. And there's there's all kinds of ideas, but none of them have been 100% uh, correct or doable, feasible, because there's all, all there's, there's always expense involved in doing any of these projects. So, so far we haven't done anything. In my opinion, society at large here in California, we won't be able to do anything. I'm sorry, I'm kind of negative. But it's too big a project. It's four generations. We need four generations of effort in order to fix it. Not one, four. Yeah. Your kids and the kids and the kids will have to get involved in, you know, steadily trying to fix it. And maybe we can fix it by removing the salt, taking it over somewhere else, and so forth. Thank you very much.